The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this afternoon's webinar, Using Students' First Language in the Multilingual Classroom. This is Sophie from English Australia, and I'm here to introduce this afternoon's speaker, Amy Brown. Um, Amy's had about 18 years of experience teaching English all over the world in places such as Estonia and Vietnam. She's currently the lead teacher on a study abroad preparation program for the University of Adelaide at Kansai Gadai University in Hirakata, Japan. So thank you so much for coming to present to us today, Amy. Thank you so much, Sophie. Thank you for having me and thank you everyone for joining today. I'm really excited to be here and sharing this information in a new format. Um, this is the first time I've given a webinar, so I hope it all goes smoothly today. We'll see. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you uh, about the use of students' first language in the ESL classroom. So there's actually a lot of data that shows that the use of students' first language is beneficial in learning a second language. Um, but this research mostly comes from classrooms where students and their teachers share a common language. So it kind of makes sense in that context, I guess. Um, but what about our classrooms with students from many different language backgrounds? And often we as teachers don't share their first languages. There are so many languages we can't be expected to share all of the languages in our classrooms. Can it also be beneficial for these classes? And if it can, how do we go about introducing the use of the first language in class in a kind of more deliberate way? Um, so I'm gonna try and answer those two questions for you today. Um, but first, what I'd like to do is start by looking at two completely different, well, different and similar classroom situations that I've personally experienced. And in particular, I'm gonna compare the way that the students' first languages were used in these classrooms. So let's see if I can move this PowerPoint. I think I should be able to. Oh, well, there we go, okay. So first of all, this will look pretty familiar to most of you, I'm sure. So I'll start by introducing you to a typical class that would see in a general English program. And this is one of my former classes. So as you can see, it's a fairly small class, but there's a lot of linguistic capital here. So we have Japanese, Korean, Mandarin, Vietnamese, and Farsi speakers in this class. There's a lot of latent linguistic knowledge here. But of course, in a typical class like this in Australia, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, students are generally discouraged from using their first language in class. And this is often supported by very restrictive policies like an English only language policy. Now I'd like to take you to another um, classroom context. This actually isn't a personal photo, it's a photo from the, the school's website. But a few years ago, I moved to Colombia with my husband and I decided to spend some time while we were there at a university brushing up on my very mediocre kind of pre-intermediate Spanish. So I was studying Spanish as a second language in a university kind of context. First of all, it was a great experience to be on the other side of the table, to be the student rather than the teacher. And um, being able to be a full-time student for a short period was really good. I recommend it to anyone. Now, there are lots of similarities between this classroom and my classrooms in Australia. Um, there were lots of different nationalities and languages in this classroom. So in my small class, we had five different nationalities. And I was actually the only one who spoke English as a first language, which was kind of a surprise to me. Um, the other mem classmates spoke German, Italian, Portuguese, and Japanese as their first languages, and most were competent in more than one language. The group was, apart from myself, also fairly young, with the majority of the students in my class in Colombia in their early 20s, which is really similar to the classes I usually teach in Australia. And as in my Australian classes, the focus was on using the target language. So more than 90% of the class was conducted in Spanish. 
but there was one big difference between the classes and that was the way that the first languages were used. And in the Colombian context, I don't just mean English, which was a common language for the group, but also we used other languages that not all of the other students or the teachers shared. So the first thing that I noticed in Colombia was that there was no exclusive language policy like we would generally see in a language school in Australia. So unlike most of the centres that I've worked in in Australia, and I can proudly say that the University of Adelaide English Language Centre is no longer one of those centres. The language centre in Colombia didn't compel students to use Spanish only in class or outside of class. So in Colombia, the first languages of students were acknowledged and used as a comparison with Spanish equivalents in a way that helped to increase clarity of the language that we were learning. The question I had to ask myself was why there was such a big difference in the attitude towards first languages in these two classrooms. Um, let's move on. Okay. So there's definitely an aspect of having a shared second language to use. So in my classroom in Colombia, we did have English, which all of us could use to some degree, and it definitely made the process of bringing in those other languages easier. But I don't believe it accounts for the like basic attitude towards first language use in the classroom, which in Colum Colombia that attitude was actually very open. But in my experience in classrooms in Australia, it seems much more closed and almost quite defensive. So I think this attitude has something to do with what Misty Adonayu labels a monolingual mindset. So Adonayu is a professor of language and linguistics at the University of Canberra. And she's written for the conversation about Australia's problem with learning languages, not teaching it, but learning languages. And she places the blame squarely at our cultural discomfort with languages other than English, which of course is a huge, English, uh, huge issue in a multicultural country like Australia. And it's an issue that I think a lot of us are really uncomfortable with, and I certainly don't want to impose that kind of attitude on my international students who are studying in Australia. We've seen this idea recently in political discourse, um, particularly with the question of more rigorous language testing in the process of gaining citizenship for internationals, although it also clearly manifests itself in our ESL classrooms. So our sector has long had a problematic relationship with other languages to the point where the role of the first language is mostly ignored in teacher training programs and manuals and that the first language is mostly seen as a source of interference with the process of language learning. But this is also the context um, in which I was trained as a young teacher. And so I spent much of the first probably six or seven years of my career believing that an English only classroom was a good classroom and that anything other than that was a failure. So I spent a lot of time and energy implementing a whole range of strategies to stop students from using their own languages in class, using their first languages. You know, I had carrot sticks the whole lot, but um, it usually wasn't very effective. And it took a lot of time, as I said, a lot of time and energy. Then after that, I mean, a few years into teaching, I just got tired. I got tired of constantly policing for first language use. And I rationalized that it was probably better just to focus on the teaching, focus on engaging the students. And hopefully this would be enough to keep them on task and using English. Again, still that English only um, environment was still an important thing for me. But it was really only after seeing the use of first language in practice in Colombia that I really felt there could be a place for it in my own classes. And I started to look more into the theory and experiment with some practical ways that I could start to introduce the first language into my own classes. Um, so basically that's what I'm going to be looking at today. I'm going to start by looking at some of the arguments for using the students' first languages in class. I'm going to talk about what students are actually doing with their first languages in class now in our kind of Australian ESL EAP environment. 
I'll talk about some practical ways that I have implemented my students' first languages into activities in the classroom. And these are just a few activities and it's just the beginning. And I'm sure there are, there's, with a little creativity, you can really expand those kinds of activities. And finally, I'll outline some of the benefits that I've personally seen since working with the first language in my own classes. So I want to start today by bringing out some of the linguistic heavyweights to help me support my argument. Um, because this kind of change in the classroom really does require quite a lot of justification, especially for language centres. And for me, there are three main benefits for learners in terms of using their first language in class that I'd like to look at. The first one, as you can see here, is language acquisition. The second one I'd like to talk about is learner identity. And finally, I'll talk about building real world skills, which I think is a really important um, aspect of this. So let's start with language acquisition. There is a lot of research that points to the first language acting as a support for language acquisition rather than as a hindrance for language acquisition, as we discussed earlier. So Meryl Swain and Sharon Lapkin have researched bilingual education in the Canadian context for many years and argue that our first language is our most important resource as language learners when we're trying to learn a second language. So we already have a vast amount of linguistic knowledge which we've learned through the process of first language acquisition. And they argue that learning is most effective when it builds upon previous learning, you know, that makes sense. So our understanding of the second language can be enhanced through connections or comparisons with the first. So in short, by limiting students' immediate access to their first language, we may be depriving them of a really useful learning tool. Now, Vivian Cook goes one step further and argues that, in fact, there can be no separation between the first and the target language. So he offers the model of a merged language area in the brain, which we can see through phenomena such as code switching. So he points to research that shows it's not only that the um, second or subsequent languages are impacted by the first, like when we can see that interference in terms of grammatical structures and pronunciation, but he also argues that when we learn a second language, this language also impacts on the first speaker's first language in measurable ways. So basically, in his view, languages do not sit neatly side by side, totally independent of each other, where we can turn one off and switch the other one on, but they're instead interdependent. And if we can accept this is the case, English-only policies are not only a barrier to effective learning, but they're also inherently artificial. The final piece of research that really resonated with me as a teacher, but also as a language learner, was from Wolfgang Butzkamp, who wrote a really interesting article called In Defense of the Mother Tongue about the use of German in English language programs in schools. In his paper, he argues that it's not only linguistic knowledge and experience that's built through the process of first language acquisition, but also life knowledge and life experience, which is built through this linguistic lens, which we can only access if we have access to the first language. So moving on, I'd like to look at something that's really important for us as teachers, or for those of us who are teaching adults in particular, um, so the second argument is related to the idea of separating a learner from their first language and what impact this has on their sense of identity. So I'm sure many of you, like me, have learnt languages as adults. We seem to be a group that is continually learning languages. Um, at the moment, I'm living and working in Japan and I'm also learning Japanese very, very slowly. So as an adult, this is a challenging and it can be ultimately a very rewarding experience. But it can also make you feel quite small and it can feel quite humiliating when you're searching for those simple words and you really feel like you can't express yourself in a clear way. I think we always need to put ourselves into our students' shoes when we consider the role of identity and 
in within communication. So Richard Foreman says that our sense of self is inevitably connected to our first language. And that's, you know, that seems really obvious, but it's important to make that explicit. And as Murray and Wigglesworth argue, it's also connected to our life experience and our own opinions and our own positions. I'm always surprised when students say that they know nothing about a particular topic. But of course, this mostly means I know nothing I can express in this language. The final argument for using first languages in class um, is that it gives us opportunities to help our students to practice important linguistic skills, such as translation. So most of our students, both the ones who choose to live or study in Australia, or those who move home and use their language skills there, or even those who move to kind of a third place, they're part of a generation that will live between languages, who have to negotiate languages, not only their first, second, third languages, but also all the other languages they meet along the way. So Guy Cook, who's the author of Translation and Language Teaching, says that translation should actually be taught as a fifth skill in our classrooms after speaking, listening, reading and writing, because that's how important translation is um, becoming in our kind of increasingly globalized world. Okay, so there seem to be some pretty good arguments in favor of using the first language in class, but I thought it would also be interesting to look at the research that has been done on what's happening in our classrooms right now. And by this I mean, what are students doing in multilingual classrooms like ours, even when there's a restrictive language policy in place? Okay. So I found three papers from different contexts that talked about just this. And I'll just go through them quickly because I think some really interesting things came up in each of them. So the first one was in a beginner level class with a small group of mostly Mandarin Chinese speakers. The students were asked by their Australian teacher to complete a group task slightly beyond their ability in the language and their conversations were recorded while they were completing this task. Um, the researcher Eileen Chow, who was an English and a Mandarin speaker, observed the class and also analysed the recordings. She found exactly what you would expect from low level language learners, that they were using the first language for comprehension, both in terms of grammatical structures and vocabulary. They used it to clarify aspects of the task together as a group. And finally, that they used Mandarin as a kind of meta language to complete the task to a better standard than they could have done without access to this language. The second paper from Storch and Wigglesworth focused on an intermediate level class. So this class was also divided into small groups with each group having a shared first language. The class were given two tasks to, com to complete and one was a mathematical task and the other was a written task. And they were told to use their first language as needed to complete the task. After, ta after the task was completed, they filled out a survey and some students were interviewed about their experience. So in their feedback, students said that they were reluctant to use their first language in class. They were very well trained class. But when they did use it, it was helpful in completing the task. So uh, the students that used the la their first language did find it helpful. One really interesting point for me that came up from the interviews, um, which actually is really obvious, but it was kind of nice to hear it explained so explicitly, um, was the way that students explained that they were silently using their first language. Um, students said that they were doing calculations in their head in the, their own language before giving the number to the group in English, or they were composing ideas in their own language before translating it into English to share it with the group. So we can see that kind of sub vocal language, uh, first language use in this particular scenario. The final piece of research was done in a pre-enrollment bridging program at the Monash University English Language Centre by Serena Grasso. And this one was really interesting to me because I've worked on these kinds of prog programs in the past. So it was really interesting to see the kind of um, information that came out of this piece of research. So there were 83 students on 
on the program who were mostly Chinese Mandarin speakers who were surveyed and some were interviewed on their use of the first language in their EAP classes. So as you can see from these numbers, the majority of them had a strong understanding of why they were being asked to use English in class. But even with this strong understanding, 78% of them said that they use their first language sometimes or often in class. Why? Well, for many of the same reasons we saw with the beginners to understand vocabulary or a grammar point, to clarify complex instructions. But one point that came up strongly in the surveys was that this group of students use their first language because it feels more normal in some situations, like sharing a joke in your first language is a lot more normal than trying to recreate that joke in a second language. So the students said it was a way of strengthening bonds between students from the same language background. And we shouldn't underestimate the socio-cultural aspects of language and communication. Grasso concluded that because of the lang first language's connection with learner identity, as well as its role in language acquisition, teachers should adopt a more flexible approach to the use of the first language in the classroom. So I thought these were all interesting because they all came to that same conclusion. Um, the implications were pretty clear. The first language shouldn't be prohibited in pair and group work in our classes. From Chow's research, we can see that the first language can be a language learning resource, allowing learners to attain higher levels of achievement than they could otherwise. And this dovetails really nicely into um, Swain and Lapkin's idea of the first language being used as a learning tool. And Storch and Wigglesworth show that the use of the first language is a normal psychological process and that even when students are outwardly only using the target language, there are these silent cross-linguistic processes taking place. And this seems to be evidence that supports um, Cook's theory of these interdependent languages in, in the brain. And finally, Grasso advocates for a more tolerant attitude towards first language use, uh, partly due to its marker, its use as a marker of um, individual and group identity. So I don't know if you're still with me, but um, if we can agree that there's an argument for using the first language in our classrooms, I think the next question is to ask, how do we do this in a kind of more considered and deliberate way? So I think it's still really important to remember that we need to encourage students to be using the target language as much as possible, um, while still benefiting from the support of their first languages and not forgetting that that first language is always there. So I'd like to take some time now to look at a few different ways that I've used my students' first languages in class that I've personally found to be effective and engaging. So let's move on to the first activity. Oh, there's a slide I missed, sorry. So the first activity that I'd like to look at is a really simple activity which is just aimed to boost students' confidence and also to give first languages a place in the classroom. Uh, I think when I started doing this, what I forgot is that students are all also um, kind of a part of this process that they also come in with this expectation of English only. So carving out a place for first languages was the first step that I found really important when I started using this in the classroom. So this is called first language show and tell and it's a great getting to know you activity with a new class and it can be done really I think at any level. So I ask representatives from each country in the classroom to just draw an outline of their country on the whiteboard and then ask students to stand up, introduce themselves, and they need to tell us something about them, introduce their city, and then just introduce a useful word or phrase in their language. Um, I give them example and this one, I don't know if you can see it, I gave the example uh, of the word stoked which they loved and they used regularly for the rest of the term, which I was really happy with. Um, we had a, quite a few Japanese students in this group. 
And um, the Japanese students, interestingly, usually they chose words or phrases from their region, the, the dialect around their region. So that was kind of interesting, even for other Japanese students in the class. This is really engaging. The student is the expert here and other students that don't share the same language background get a sense of the linguistic diversity in the class, which actually they really enjoy. It's also still an English activity. It's all done in English. The phrase has to be explained, the context, the level of formality, the pronunciation. And for higher levels, I found that this activity can also be a really good opportunity for students to extend themselves while they're giving these kinds of explanations. So that's a nice one to start with, and it kind of sets the tone in the classroom as well. The second activity that I'd like to talk about is using first language translations. So Philip Kerr was in Australia a couple of years ago and he was talking about this topic of using first languages in the classroom. And he talked about getting students to do short um, translations from English texts into their own languages and then maybe giving that translation to another group with the same background and getting them to translate it back into English and comparing the results. Um, I haven't actually used that translation activity in my class. Actually in Japan it's much easier with a monolingual class for us to do that kind of activity because it fits in really easily and I have had teachers in my team in Japan get groups to translate sections from a Japanese children's book into English for example, um, which is uh, an activity they really got into and the language choices they had to discuss and make were really complex. But the activity that I'm going to explain to you today is something that I like to do in class that's really easy to do with any level and really easy to do with a very multilingual class. And it's a discussion activity with first language texts. I think this is a good activity because, you know, students all have their smartphones, they have access to all kinds of texts in the target language and in their first language. So a good way to get started is to ask students to get online, get on their phones and to find a current news story from their city or region online and ask them to get ready to explain it to their classmates. So they're looking at this text and they have to decide what they need to um, translate, what kind of information they need to get across, what new vocabulary they need to explain. So this is a great activity that can again be done at most levels. So higher level students can be encouraged to give more detail and lower level students can keep it more simple. But the key here is that the process is really language rich in terms of the kind of language decisions they're making. It's really engaging and it places the student as an expert. It's their place, their context, their story. I also find it's a lot more rewarding as an activity than getting students to fumble through kind of an artificially graded reading text that they can't personally connect with. So this one in particular, it's super simple, um, but it's worked so well with all of the groups that I've used it with. Okay, now I'm going to look at a couple of activities that are a little bit more focused on the language learning potential of the first language. So these are activities that are focused on linguistic transfer. So it's a little bit more focused. So the first one um, I'm gonna look at is a grammar comparison. And this can work if you're focused on a particular structure. Here we were looking at a basic subject verb clause structure. So as a teacher, you can give a clear example of the structure that you're focused on and ask students to translate the original into their own language. And so from here, we can analyze the structures as you can see in the image. So here we were looking for the subject and the verb in the clauses. So we can see, for example, in the Japanese translation, of the text, the verb is at the end of the sentence. And for example, in Spanish, the subject isn't necessary within the clause. So this is a really good way to reinforce the structures. Um, but importantly, it's also a really great way for us as teachers to learn about those la other languages, the first languages of our students, and to be able to really pinpoint areas of interference. 
So it's a learning tool for the students. It's also really a learning tool for us, and it's something that I've really um, been able to been able to use um, to understand more about kind of those structures that cause problems with the groups of students that we often work with. Another aspect of this activity that I hadn't expected was the conversation that came up with the students around the similarities and differences between different languages. And that conversation had to happen all in English because of the multilingual nature of the group. So it was a great way to highlight and appreciate the linguistic diversity of the group as well. Another way I've used this kind of linguistic transfer activity is with pronunciation. So this is another relatively simple activity where students from different language backgrounds are just given a piece of A3 paper and they work in groups. On one half of the paper, the group lists some of the pronunciation problems they find that they have in English. So it might be the sounds that are difficult or some other aspect of pronunciation. Um, they can discuss this in their own language before presenting it to the group. On the other side of the page, they flip it and try to think of some aspects of their own language that foreigners find hard to master. So this might be a particular word or a particular sound that is specific to, these, to their own language. Um, and then they present these to a group in a kind of interactive pronunciation class. Um, this is all done in English, but again, there's the element of the student as, as expert in this activity, particularly when they're explaining aspects of their own language. So if we have a look at the first example here on the left, this was from a group of Indonesian students, and you can see some of the issues that they raised in terms of pronunciation in English, the long and short vowel sounds, the p and f sounds and um, some different points actually it went kind of into grammar towards the end which was interesting but then on the other side they also looked at some of those um, areas of their own language Bahasa Indonesia that are difficult for foreigners the fact that there's not a strong ch sound in Bahasa Indonesia and there's no particular stress put in a word so being able to explain those points was really interesting on the right hand side we have an example from a Chinese um, group and they were talking for example about the tones in Chinese which are of course different from English and some of the sounds they found more difficult in English as well um, so again, this activity is really interactive. It allows students to share their language with others. It still happens, most of the class happens in English. And it also gives you as the teacher, or me as the teacher, a lot of really useful information about where our students are coming from linguistically and what help they feel that they need. So also, again, it's kind of feeding into this greater linguistic knowledge of our students for us as well. Okay, so those are some of the activities that I've used with my students. And as I said, most students have really engaged with them. They find them challenging, they find them motivating, but as well as um, the students enjoying it, there's a lot in this for us as teachers. Just moving on to that last slide. Okay, so, oh, sorry, just head back, got excited there. Um, so for me as a teacher, what I've noticed is, first of all, there's a lot less policing of language use. Um, I still want my students to use English as much as possible in the classroom and um, encouraging students to learn English is still a big part of what I do. Uh, sometimes groups or individual students need that reminder, but there's also more of a tolerance for first language use when it's helpful for the students. And sometimes I encourage students to use their first language to have a discussion if I feel it's going to be helpful in the longer term um, for those students for the task that we're looking at. 
it also really has helped me to understand my students' linguistic backgrounds better. And I think it also helps the students to understand their own linguistic backgrounds better. It means that we both have a better understanding of where we can expect interference. So we don't have to guess why students are having problems with certain structures. We can actually just use the first language as a tool to help us understand those areas of difficulty. So unlike an English only classroom where this, it's kind of blocked, um, in this classroom, you've built in the option of asking, how does this look in your language? And you've built into the students that it's okay for them to talk about that um, with other students or with you. And finally, I think that this type of classroom where you're you've built in that um, first language use, we can have more open conversations with students. I feel like I learn a lot more about them as individuals, more about their background. And also I feel like I have the opportunity to start a more open and respectful relationship with students because of this. So to sum up, what I want in my own class is on the surface only a small change from English only um, to English mostly. So by bringing a limited, controlled and deliberate use of the first language in the classroom, and I think that's really important. There are still challenges with this. I still find challenges with it. It does require flexibility because you can't always predict how things will go when you open the class up in this way. And that can be really difficult. I found it quite difficult. I think it can be difficult for teachers because it means you have to let go of the control you have as the expert English speaker in the classroom. It's also about finding the right balance of languages in the classroom, which really depends on the context that you're working in. But overall, I found that introducing the first language into my class has been a positive change and one that I'm personally really happy about and a lot more comfortable with. Um, so that brings me to the end of the presentation today. Thank you so much for listening. I hope that that has been useful and um, yeah, I'd be really interested to hear any, uh, answer any questions that you have or um, share any comments that you have as well. So if you do have questions, please feel free to type them into the box and um, yeah, that's, that's it for me today. Thanks so much, Amy. We'll just wait for the questions to come through. There is a comment, which is fantastic session. That's Exclamation mark. I agree. That's good to hear. <laughs> okay, I'll just wait for some more questions to come through. <clears throat> Yeah, it was um, it was really fascinating hearing your first hand experiences of introducing the students' F, um, first language into the classroom. What a positive change you found it to be. Mm -hmm. um, so as a mixed yeah. in as well with the theory. So thank you so much for that. Um, if you don't have a particular question, but would like to make a comment, you feel free also to type that in. Great. Someone said very useful and thought provoking. Thanks. I'm going to try a few of these activities. Um, oh, that's nice. Someone else has said that they've also found people's views um, on using L1 in the classroom to be very dogmatic so that this mm. um, was a very welcome presentation. Yeah. I, I actually gave this presentation to colleagues um, in my at the University of Adelaide and it is very interesting. I mean, people hold their views very tightly, but I think um, when you break it down, there is a lot to be said for re-evaluating those um, deeply held views. And uh, it's it's been interesting to see that change. Wonderful. Um, there's a couple of questions here. I wonder if you have any comments on using L1 in a monolingual class where the teacher doesn't understand the student's L1. Mm. 
Oh, that's a very good question because that's where I am right at the moment. Um, I'm teaching in Japan, so we have monolingual classes and uh, it can really going in, I, I was thinking, where where does this fit within my classroom environment now? But I think it really, it really can fit in quite well. We were talking about the use of like Philip Kerr's translation activity and you think how can the teacher be involved if they don't share the student's first language but actually that comes in in that comparison aspect at the end so students translating from English into their own language and then back into English and then actually we have two English texts that we're looking at and the teacher can be involved in that comparison and looking at um, the different uses of English and talking about those choices uh, so I think there is room for it um, Again, it's just about uh, finding ways that you can do that and still um, have some kind of input as a teacher or get students to explain. The other way that I've used it is with maybe more complex discussions, getting students to discuss in groups in their first language but present their ideas in English. So that can be great because you get a lot more detail from those kinds of presentations because they've had a chance to really connect with the, that knowledge that's been built up in the first language. So I think that's another great way of using the first language in a mono, um, mono linguistic class. Monolingual, that's the word I was looking for. Okay, thank you. Someone has a question about how teachers have responded to engaging with these types of activities. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, in high stakes courses, teachers tend mm -hmm. to feel students don't have time to waste and need time yeah. to maximise time speaking English. Your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that comes back to like the um, bridging programs and we have those ideas that you're right that maybe there's no time to waste and I think some of these activities do take more time particularly those um, ones that are looking at linguistic transfer but some of them actually don't take any more time to implement in the classroom it might just be giving students a chance to think about something in their first language or discuss something um, briefly in their first language before building it into a, a more English focused activity. Uh, so I still think there's room for these kinds of activities in those uh, classrooms where time is limited and you need to get students moving. But also with those kinds of classes, I think students need to know, and um, this is a discussion that I had um, with teachers in my own uh, learning center is, Students need to be able to negotiate between languages, their own and other languages. And that's really a skill that our, for example, students going into a university environment to say it's English only here, but it's definitely not going to be like that when you get into that big new environment where uh, you're going to have to negotiate your use of languages. Why not start that practice earlier? you know, when we have them and we can talk to them about those kinds of things. So I think there's always room for it. Great. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely, it does. Someone else has commented that there's a related area called translanguaging that's worth mm. reading the literature on if people are interested. Yeah, interesting, thank you. Hmm. I've actually started to see um, a couple of people presenting on translanguaging at different events as well. So it's, oh, um, it's becoming, uh, it's entering the vernacular, which is good to see. Yeah, great, that's um, something I'll, I'll look at. Somebody has asked if um, you have any references that they could do some further reading with. Uh, yeah, so I've put all my references on this PowerPoint, so you right. have access to that as we come up. Um, so there's some really interesting, uh, interesting references there. So if you have access to that PowerPoint, you'll see those references just at the end. Hmm. Wonderful. And um, you'll, everybody who's attended today's session will get a follow-up email tomorrow. Um, and on that will be the link to the recording and to the slides from today's session, which Amy is um, really generously sharing with us. So thanks for that as well, Amy. No problem.
Okay, there's so many comments coming through and thank yous. Um, but yeah, I think somebody, one person in particular, sorry, I'll just go back to it, um, has said that, uh, that he thinks accessing L1 in monolingual classes is more common, especially if the mm -hmm. teacher shares the same L1. And this yeah, is, absolutely. Yeah, and this is an edge that TNE Elicos has over onshore provision and as such something that we should be exploring. So um, I think it's just a comment about, you know, offshore provision of Elicos programs having that edge as opposed to um, if it's being delivered in Australia and there is an English-only mm. policy, then um, we're not tapping into those same resources. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that comment. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you very much um, to everybody for attending today's session. And also thanks again to you, Amy. Um, it was yeah, absolutely fascinating. So thank you so much. Thanks, Sophie. Great. All right. See you later, everybody.